Sorry, Jim. All right. Thank you, Father. It's March 18th, 2018, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we'll start off with prayer. We'll get into praise and worship, and then we'll get into the word. We're going to look at the book of Peter today. So let us start off in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you reveal yourself to us in a new and living way like we have not seen you before. That you reveal your word to us, Lord Jesus Christ, that we rightly divide the word of truth. I bind the spirit of deception, the spirit of false religion, the carnal mind, and anything that would come against the purity of your word, including myself. So, Lord, thank you for opening up our hearts to receive. Thank you for pouring out the wisdom and revelation that only you can from the headquarters of heaven, from the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Okay, we're going to start off with the praise and worship song. This is a song that I've been listening to this week, and I just really enjoy it. So I'll share my screen, and it's about a 10-minute worship song. So start off in uh, the praise and worship of our Lord, and we'll go from there. <clears throat> Unto the Lamb in the midst of the throne, the beautiful Lamb in the midst of the throne, the worthy Lamb, the glorious Man, slain. Unto the Lamb in the midst of the throne, the beautiful Lamb in the midst of the throne, the worthy Lamb, the glorious man, slain. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written on the inside and out, sealed with seven seals. I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. Who is worthy to take this scroll and lose its seal? Unto the Lamb in the midst of the throne, the beautiful Lamb in the midst of the throne, the worthy Lamb, the glorious man. Unto the Lamb in the midst of the throne, the beautiful Lamb in the midst of the throne, the worthy Lamb, the glorious Man, slain. And there was no one in heaven or on the earth or underneath. No one was found worthy. I began to weep. And one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the light of the tribe of Judah has Oh, the 
Amen. I love that worship song. It's a few ways that I judge worship, and the Bible does say a spiritual man makes judgment of all things. So don't just uh, participate in something without using your uh, God given common sense and your Bible knowledge and the spirit of discernment, especially in these times. But there's a few things that I judge when I listen to uh, praise and worship. Does it make me look at the person that is singing the song, or does it make me look at Jesus? Any songs that you hear that make you look at that person, what a great singer and what a great this and what a great that, and they exceed or are above glorifying Jesus Christ, you got to be careful. I, I wouldn't trust it. But if you listen to a song and you say, you know, that makes me want to see Jesus Christ and worship with him and all the attention and focus was on him. That's safe. That's a safe place to worship. 
uh, you got to be mindful of so much uh, these times. Uh, music, all is not clean, but some is clean. I, I believe that was a uh, pure worship. And just uh, by the way, she was singing uh, about a few scriptures out the book of Revelation when uh, Jesus was called and counted worthy to, to open a scroll when no other man was worthy. So that's in Revelation. And uh, I love that because in these last days, you have to have the qualities of the Lamb of God and also of the Lion of the tribe of Judah to be able to stand and resist uh, the onslaught of Satan, the world, and even your own flesh. So that's just a side note, because Jesus Christ being as beautiful as he is and as amazing as he is, he has the qualities of a lamb, but the qualities of the lion at the same time. That, that's amazing. Only God can do that. So we're going to look at the book of Peter today. And uh, I, I taught a little bit last week about ways to elevate. And one of the ways to elevate was to receive correction. And the Holy Spirit did gently correct me about some, uh, not any false teachings that I've been doing, but I like to teach about concepts, you know, because uh, I'm that's the way my mind works. But the Holy Spirit gently uh, corrected me and said, you know, son, uh, that's fine to do that. But at times you need to go upon my word line upon line. So that's what we're going to do today. We're literally going to go through the uh, entire book of Peter, uh, time permitting. And uh, Craig, if you don't mind giving me a heads up when we get uh, close to to, to the top of the hour because I, I don't have a clock right here i have my screen full screen so i don't i don't uh, see the time but we're going to go through the uh, book of peter and i'll just read it line upon line and as the holy spirit uh, quickens my spirit to go more in depth about a certain scripture i'll do that but we're going to be looking at first peter starting in chapter one and verse one and uh that's what we're looking at today so I'll read uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithany, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. So first thing I'll uh, point out, the foreknowledge of God the Father. God knows who's going to repent and be saved from birth. So, you know, those who are born again and those who are, will be born again, God knows exactly. Because he is the I am, as we talked about, that means he sees the beginning from the end, the end from the, the beginning. Everything to God is basically in the present because he sees it. He knows everything uh, before it happens. So. You know, uh, sometimes I look at myself and I say, you know, God, why have you been so merciful to me? Or why did you get me out of this situation? Or why, why did you give me a break here? You know, I could go into a long testimony about different things that God has done for me. And I'm sure you could. Well, God knew who was going to repent. He knew who was going to serve him. So when I read First Peter 1 and 2, the foreknowledge of God, the Father, God knows. God knows. He knows exactly who's going to repent commit to faith and obedience and serve in his kingdom. I think that's so powerful because, uh, man, God is good. God is good. And he knows mercy is also an investment. I'm just kind of going off, uh, off topic just a little bit, but sometimes things come to my spirit and I just want to share with everyone. Uh, mercy is an investment. You got to think of all the time God has shown mercy in, to us. He invested in you. He knew you were going to repent. He, 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 and those uh, that he called, he showed great mercy. I just believe I have a revelation of the mercy of God. And God uh, has invested greatly in us, showing mercy. He said he died for us while we were yet sinners. You got to think about all the years that you were not saved, living like hell. And God still showed mercy to you because he invested. He knew that if he continued to show mercy to you, the goodness of God would lead to re repentance. So never think that mercy is not a good investment. It is. God said, love mercy. And sadly, a lot of people don't. But I do because he's shown me so much mercy. So picking back up in verse three, Best, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, 
undefiled and unfading kept in heaven for you. Now, we have spoke about this earlier. Your reward is not here. You may have some temporary rewards here on this earth, but there's an inheritance for you eternally in heaven. That's why I try my best to preach and teach people to be spiritually minded and not carnally minded, to look at heaven as their home and not this earth as their home, and to always be looking to God, the Father, through Jesus, the Son, by the Holy Spirit, to your inheritance in heaven. Now, you can begin to receive that now, and many of you have. Your inheritance to walk in the Spirit, your inheritance, of course, of salvation, your inheritance of spiritual gifts. And I, and I really preach and teach that I want people to receive their inheritance that is kept in heaven for them. But your, inhe your inheritance is, is in heaven. It's not in this earth. You know, you'll get some temporary things on this earth and praise God for them. I hope everybody affiliated with this ministry and everybody that is born again and truly uh, seeking to please God. I hope, I hope you receive great gifts naturally and spiritually here in this life. Hey, James. But, James, yes. what you was talking of, yeah, that everything in this world is kind of like taking a Tylenol, you know, for a headache or something. It's just temporary, man. It goes away. There's... There's nothing permanent in this world, is there? Yeah, this, this, this world is temporary. And thanks for uh, tapping in, Craig. And by the way, if anyone ever wants to tap in, please just, there's a button that you can raise your hand and it will unmute you. I like these to be interactive. We just had to start muting because there was just so much background noise and, you know, just for just common sense. But don't think you're muted, meaning that you cannot be unmuted to speak. So if you have something you want to say, just uh, like I said, there's a tab and I'll see that your hand is raised and Craig, I'll un unmute you. So. Um, so yeah, this world, world is temporary. Little hand. How do I the, raise my hand? The world is temporary. And, uh, if you look on that, there's a three, three dots, um, chat, or you can just type in the chat either or, uh, but there is a hand. I can't uh, find it right now. Since we do these live, I, I can't go into that right now. We have to do it before or after, but just, uh, um, uh, go ahead, Rhonda. Uh, if you will, uh, unmute Rhonda for me, Craig, cause I'm not co-host right now. Okay, Go ahead, Rhonda. You. Um, you said um, we're not to be carnally minded. Now, I was told last night that if I believe in the um, the laws of Moses, that I'm carnally minded. Um, what would you say about that? Did you hear my question? Okay, I'm sorry. I had a bad internet connection for a little while there. You, uh, you'll have to repeat that one more time for me. Uh, okay, you Ms. said that um, you mentioned that um, we're supposed to be spiritually minded and not carnally minded. And I was told last night that if I believe the laws of Moses, that I'm carnally minded. What well, that's not. I, I say that's not true because that's why the Bible says study to show yourself approved, because Jesus Himself said Moses or the teachings of Moses, or the law of Moses, pointed to him. <laughs> he That's said, what I thought. You know, he had said to do my own research, and I did do my own research, and I realized, that's when I realized that um, we are still under the laws of Moses. But I, well, may, I was told that that makes me carnal. Well, I wouldn't say you're under the law of Moses. Now you're under the law of the Spirit, but the law of Moses still applies because Jesus came to fulfill the law. So when you get in the New Testament, the New Testament says that the law is not made for a righteous man. Uh, it's made for lawbreakers. And the reason that is because when you come into Jesus Christ and have a new nature, your nature has changed. So therefore, you don't need a law because you don't want to do the things that you have been warned not to do in the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not lie, et cetera, et cetera. But the more you study the Old Testament, the more the Holy Spirit will begin to reveal Jesus Christ to you, even in the whole Old Testament. So continue to do that and continue to allow the Holy Spirit to reveal himself to you even more, even in the Old Testament. And also think about this. When Jesus walked the earth, he didn't have the New Testament. All he had was the Old Testament. So you're going to tell us that our Lord and Savior, who studied the uh, first five books, the Pentateuch, uh, while he was on this earth, you're going to tell him, Tell us that's not relevant when that's all that Jesus studied when he was on this earth. That's crazy. 
So let me continue. Thank and you. I, I appreciate Thank you very uh, yeah, much. I, I appreciate your questions and uh, keep them coming. I'm just going to try to get through this book of Peter. It may not be realistic, but uh, like I said, if you have a question, just uh, tap in the chat and we'll uh, mute you. Okay, continuing. Verse four, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. I'm just going to stop there quickly. You're going to have various tri trials. And it's just a pet peeve of mine that when a person has a various trial, a trial of their faith, a trial of circumstances, that they're viewed as something is not right. Well, it says right here that for a little while you will be grieved with various trials so expect it but just be of a renewed mind and rejoice even in the trials because you know that god is testing the genuineness of your faith so that your faith faith i'm in verse seven now so that the t tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes though it is tested by fire may be found to re result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of jesus christ a faith that hasn't been tested cannot be trusted. And I would go on to say a relationship that has not been tested cannot be trusted. Uh, me and Craig's relationship got tested recently. Got to be tested to be trusted. I don't care if you're married. I don't care how godly your husband is, how godly your wife is, even your children, how godly they are. There's going to be a test of that relationship. Then after that test, you'll know if you can trust it. God himself, what did he do with the father of our faith, Abraham? At that time, he was Abram. Hey, Abram, you see your son right there? Pick him up, take him to the mountain, and I'm going to have you uh, put a sword to his throat and kill him. I'm going to have you sacrifice your own son. God tested Abram. What did Abram do? Picked up his son, headed to the top of the mountain. He uh, rose his hand with the sword, was about to strike, and then the Holy Spirit stopped him and said, look, there's a ram in the thicket. That's the sacrifice. Take that one and said, I was just testing you, Abe. I was te just testing you, Abraham. I was seeing what you were made of. Like you got tested, Imogen. I was seeing what you were made of, Craig. Miss Ann, Angela. God, he will do that. I'm going to see what's really in you. I'm going to test you. God does that. So fiery trials, those are for, from God at times. He may use the devil to, to as a pawn to try you, but he, he's trying you. And that's elevation when you pass those type of tests. So we know that. <clears throat> I get kind of just uh, passionate about that because I've been tested so many times and I've had people look at me like something was wrong with me because I was going through a test. Well, I'm going to be honest. I thank God for that test because I got to know God better and I got to realize who I could trust. Because sometimes you go through tests and people expose themselves. They turn their back on you. They accuse you. Now you know, hey, I don't know if I can trust our relationship. I don't even know if we need a relationship. And I'm convinced that sometimes God does that just to break you free from, from people. When I was at the lowest point of my life at one point, and I bowed down to pray, and I had lost everything. I heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say, if you got me, you got everything. I heard Jesus Christ himself tell me personally, when I had nothing, literally, no money, no car, no job, no home, no possessions, nothing. I heard the Holy Spirit say to me, if you have me, you have everything. And that's what everybody who's a true believer needs to know. If you have the Holy Spirit, you got everything. That's why David prayed after he sinned, you know, God, just please don't take your Holy Spirit from me because that's all I got. That's all I got. That's all you got is the blood, the word, and the spirit. That's all you got. <clears throat> so picking back up in verse eight, though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and re rejoice with joy 
that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. That's the true outcome of your faith, the true salvation of your soul. Deliverance from evil, deliverance from the world, deliverance from the carnal mind, deliverance from the devil. The reason I make a point of this, because if you watch some preachers on television or listen on radio, they'll make you think the outcome of your soul is, uh, the outcome of your faith is stuff, things, possessions. That's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. It's just... It just bothers me because it's a lie because I've been in communication with uh, some uh, men in Africa and some of the poor countries in Africa. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, gathering funds to be able to send to help orphanage, help orphanages there. But uh, my point is, man, they basically have nothing. And they got the strongest faith that I've seen probably in a long time. So you're going to tell me because they don't have possessions or they don't have new cars or new houses or a new church building. You don't tell me that they don't have faith. It's just uh, I'm just uh, kind of just trying to stay calm because it just I just just makes me mad. But <clears throat> obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Verse 10 concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquired what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. Now, these were prophets that saw basically the, the coming of Christ and then him coming to this earth and then going to the cross and then dying for our sins and shedding his blood so we can be bought back from Satan. You know, some prophets saw that before Jesus came and they were like, what is this? Well, that's what they were seeing, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were to follow. Just so you know, and anybody that listens to this later, what really happened at the cross? Okay, you've heard it before. Jesus died for my sin. Jesus died for my sin. Okay. At the cross, yes, he did die for your, your sin. but more. To go in more depth, he shed his blood for the forgiveness of your sin. He shed his blood for the cleansing of your sin. And even more importantly, he bought your soul back from Satan. It was as if God and the devil basically had a contract after Adam and Eve fell. When Eve fell, followed by Adam's fall, the fall of man, Satan had possession of their soul because he gave it over to them when he disobeyed God and they disobeyed God. And God the Father said, there's only one thing that is worthy to buy their souls back, and that's the blood of Jesus Christ. That's why the blood of Jesus Christ is so powerful. He, he literally bought us back by his own own blood purchased us that's why when you're born again you no longer belong to yourself no you've been purchased you no longer belong to satan you've been purchased that's why once you've been born again truly unless you willingly go back satan can't no you've been purchased now, he's going to try everything to deceive, to tempt, to get you to sin, to get you to stop believing in God, stop obeying God, make you think you're not worthy, make you turn your back on God. He's going to try it, but it's all tricks because you have legally in the spirit realm been purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Man, the blood of Jesus Christ, if we only knew, if we really only understood how much he has done by shedding his blood for us. It's so powerful. That blood is holy. His blood is holy. Jesus never committed a sin. The righteous one died for the unrighteous. The holy one died for the unholy. Picking back up in verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, 
things into which the angels long to look. So uh, just a quick principle here. Uh, in verse 12, it says they were serving not themselves, but you. Now, a lot of people here, certain things you go through in life, struggles, battles, wars, faith battles, prayer battles. You're not going through it for yourself. You're going through it for your family. You're going through it for the next person that you're going to minister to five years from now, that since you have developed uh, your spirit and you have passed certain tests, now you can uh, minister to them. You don't go through everything you go through for yourself. You go through it for others, including your family, friends, church, community, the lost, the world, just like Jesus did. You think Jesus had to die on the cross for himself? No. He was holy. He never committed a sin. He didn't need to. What did he go to cross for? For us. So you think God's going to do anything different with us? He's going to send us through certain trials and tribulations and sufferings so that we pay the price for others. You may see Craig in the background not seeming like he's doing a whole lot. He's paying a price behind the scenes. You may see Imogen in the background seemingly not doing much. She's paying the price in the background. You may see Angela not, you know, looking like, oh, she's not doing a whole lot. She's paying a price in the background. I'm paying a price in the background. I'm expecting these Bible studies to go out for the salvation of souls. Period. Period. I'm not just going through this just for my own sake. I want to see some souls saved. Sorry, the Holy Spirit just hit me heavy. <clears throat> kind of got to slow down because it's just heavy on me right now. We got to get these souls. <clears throat> <clears throat> so um, picking back up in verse 13 therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober minded sober minded set your hope fully on the grace that would be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ so we prepare our minds for action we don't just sit and read the Bible we read the Bible and become equipped so we can go out and take action preach, teach Cast out devils, heal the sick, feed the poor, minister to the elderly. We're getting a renewed mind, so we begin to think like God, and we take action on behalf of God on this earth as the body of Christ. Also, we're sober-minded. As I say all the time, you don't come into a Bible study like this and just take every word that I say as absolutely true. You come in here with a sober mind, already have done your studies and continue to do your studies. And you say, you know what? That lines up with what I heard in my prayer time or in my study time. That lines up with what I read last week when the Holy Spirit was revealing something to me. Or you say, that does not line up. I'm sober-minded. So therefore, I'm not just going to accept that. We don't just watch TBN and CBN and accept every single thing that any preacher says on there. We're sober-minded. We're vigilant. We're diligent. We're serious minded about this word. This is not a game. This is not a joke. This is not practice. This is the real thing. This is really souls on, your, on the line. This is really your soul on the line. This is really the last days. This is really the days where people will not endure sound doctrine. This is really the times where the great falling away is happening. This is really the time where people are uh, setting up ministers to, to feed and, and speak into their itching ears. This is really the time to be serious. And I don't care if somebody tells you you're taking it too serious. This is your soul. You got one life to live. You got one opportunity to serve God and please God before you are taken from this earth and taken to the judgment where God will ask you, did you believe in my son? Did you obey my son? And did you do what I tell you to do? So this is not a time to play. This is not a time to tell a bu bunch of jokes. I do enjoy my life. I did have a great time last night at the movies, but at the same time, I'm balanced. And I say, you know what, God, I'm keeping my mind sober. I'm praying for you to keep my mind sober, God. I will not allow myself to drop my guard and be deceived in these last days or to allow my flesh to take over and be led by my flesh and not being led by the spirit. And that's the same way you should feel. That's why these Bible studies are interactive. Because I'm expecting God to draw people that are taking their salvation serious and they got something to say because they've been hearing from the Holy Spirit. Yeah, God anointed me and appointed me as the teacher 
of this Bible study. But you're going to tell me you don't have the Holy Spirit and you can't interject and tell us what the Holy Spirit has been revealing to you in your own personal walk? I'm saying you can. Be sober minded. Also, set, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The grace, which is the power of God, the undeserved kindness of God, no matter how good your conduct gets, your hope better be built on nothing less than Jesus Christ's blood and his righteousness. I see a lot of self-righteousness these days in church. And it's like, I do this, I do that, I serve on this ministry team, I did this, I did that. I'm like, okay, you better have your confidence fully on Jesus Christ because no one is worthy other than him. And God has not accepted any other sacrifice for your salvation other than Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross and your belief in his resurrection. So set your hope fully on Jesus Christ. Don't believe a lie that good deeds are going to get you into heaven. Faith in Jesus Christ, faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, his blood washing you, his spirit resurrecting you. That's what's going to get you into heaven. Belief in Jesus Christ and obedience to Jesus Christ and his word, not good deeds. That's why these false religions that concentrate on good deeds and doing this and doing that, they're going to be sorely mistaken when they die if they don't repent and accept Jesus Christ. I do good deeds because the New Testament did, did say that Jesus went about, about doing good. So I do good deeds. We, we know the story of the Good Samaritan, but I'm not saying, God, I did this good deed, let me into heaven. I'm saying, God, I believe in Jesus Christ and his birth, sinless life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That's why I believe I'm qualified to go to heaven, period. And that's the truth. <clears throat> that's why you can't get down on yourself or to too uh, lofty and high-minded. It's always Jesus Christ. Picking up on verse 14. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all your conduct. So that just balances out what I just said about faith alone. Yes, faith alone, but faith without works is dead. So your conduct needs to be uh, mirroring your, your faith. You know, your actions need to be speaking or, or your living testimony for your faith. You know, your living sacrifice. Let your conduct, let the Holy Spirit clean your conduct. There's things that I, I just don't even do now that I once did because the Holy Spirit has cleaned my soul and is cleaning my soul and the blood of Jesus is cleaning my soul and my conduct has changed. There's no way you can come to God who says, renew your mind, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and do the same things that you once did that you were, when you were in the world. There's no possible way. There's no possible way. You need to go back to the drawing board. You need to, this is what you need to do. If you're doing the same things that you did when you were in the world, this is what you need to do. You need to go to a room, shut the door, turn on the lamp, and say, God, save my soul. You need to get born again. If you're doing exactly the same things that you're doing, you were doing when you were in the world or living in sin, you need to get born again. Just that, it's just that simple. You need to get honest with yourself and you need to get honest with God and you say, you know what? God, I have not stopped drinking, smoking, fornicating, whatever it is. Obviously, I haven't been born again. Because once you're born again, that spirit hits your spirit and combines with your spirit and he gives you the desires of him his spirit, period. And that doesn't mean that you'll never stumble. That doesn't mean that you will never sin because you, you have a sinful nature that you have to war against with the Holy Spirit. But if you're living a lifestyle of sin, you just need to be born again. Just be honest. Just be honest with yourself and be honest with God. That's a great weapon against Satan against, and against your wicked flesh is honesty of heart. So be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Now, to me, there's a lot there. There's a prophecy there. You shall be holy, meaning God is continually, progressively cleaning you and bringing in you into holiness. And holiness, one of the def definitions is separation. 
and that separation from worldliness, separation from sin. So God is doing that. But your cooperation is uh, absolute necessity. And your cooperation is your will. That's why people whose will don't come into agreement with God's will. Don't even think about going to heaven. I don't care if you go to church every Sunday, every Wednesday, and give an offering every time. If your will, your human free will, has not come into agreement with God's will, which is God's word and God's spirit, you're deceived. And you need God to reveal the truth to you. And you're going to know when this is happening. You want to know how I know? Because I experienced it. When you have similar experiences to what Jesus had in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he had to say, Father, please take this cup for me. And then he had to say, you know what? Not my will, but thy will. And he felt that pain on the inside, like that internal suffering that you feel sometimes when you want to do your thing, but God is saying, no, you do this thing. That's when you know, okay, I I'm saved. I'm saved. I, I know I am. I'm saved. I'm saved now. I know I am because I got something in me telling me to go God's way and I'm coming into agreement with it even though the uncrucified part of my thought life still wants to do something else. So that internal struggle, that's a characteristic and a sign of salvation. If you have no struggle going on in you, no conviction, if you can sin with no conviction, oh my goodness, you just need to get born again. I know I keep saying it and I'm not trying to be funny. I'm absolutely serious. You, you need to be born again. He said, no man enter the kingdom of heaven without being born again. That's a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit that his blood cleanses you, opens up the heaven so that you can receive from God freely and you can interact with God and you can be led by the Spirit. That's living right there, being led by the Spirit. <clears throat> Verse 17, and if you call on him as a father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, Conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. So if you ever hear somebody say, only God could judge me, <laughs> you better know that God is a judge and he's going to judge you. You better not say that like, oh, only God can judge. Man, he said right here. And if you call him as a father who judges impartially, that means he has no partiality. He's not like a human that may be partial to one person and partial to another person or bias or, you know, preferences. He's going to judge with no partiality. He's going to judge according to the truth. Like I've seen or heard of people that have had experiences with the judgment of God will be like and how they had to go before the Lord. They said, and like I said, always go on the word of God. Don't go on signs and wonders and visions. Those are legitimate at times from God, but the foundation is the, is the word of God. But some of these signs, wonders, visions are truly from God. But anyway, they said, man, uh, basically I went before the judgment seat of God. They said his presence of love and truth and holiness was so strong that you couldn't even think that you could get away with a lie you couldn't even think that you could get away with a sin. You wouldn't even take have the nerve to even try to convince God of something that wasn't true. You know, like you like children do with parents, you know, try to, well, you know, try to basically deceive you, trick you. You cannot do that with God. You cannot. He is so holy, so pure. He is truth. He is righteousness. He is love. You cannot trick him. Now, the reason I'm harping on this because I see a lot of church people that fool a lot of other church people. Okay? I see a lot of religious people that fool a lot of other religious people into thinking that they're this upstanding kingdom citizen, saint, living a pure, holy life. That is so stupid to me. Why would you try to deceive other people when other people don't even really matter? God matters. And you cannot deceive him. 
that's why you got to be kind of hard. If you're a parent, you got to be kind of hard on your children growing up because it's some about the Adamic nature, that sinful nature that just makes people think that they can deceive other people. And I really think the default way of thinking for humans is really witchcraft and deception. We try to deceive others. We try to deceive ourselves. We try to deceive, you know, you always try to make yourself look like something that you're really not. Even though I believe in having confidence and self-confidence and putting your best foot forward. I believe in that. But when you get down to the spirit and the soul, God can see clearly. It's, he has basically x-ray vision of what's not only who's in you, even as a born again believer, believer who is in you is Jesus Christ, but what is in you is a whole nother story. you got a lot of stuff in you that has to go through a process of sanctification. So my thing is, why not just get real with God and say, God, I know I got this stuff in me. That's why I'm coming to you. There's no one else that I can go to to cleanse me, to purify me, to forgive my sins, to cleanse me of my sin. I don't understand why people try to just want to look good in the eyes of man so so desperately. I guess I do understand it because you go to elementary school and you know, you're, you know, the teacher and, you know, classmates and you want to look good and, you know, you raised your hand and you answered the question and, you know, you gave the wrong answer and everybody laughed and you felt stupid and you never wanted to have that feeling again. So you try to look good and try to make everybody think that you were perfect. Man, that, that's it's unrealistic. It's unrealistic. Don't worry about people. Love people, but don't worry about people. Focus on God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because that's who saved you. That's who can save you, and that's who will save you. And in the end of all things, that's who's going to judge you. So my thing is, just be honest. You look at the Psalms, that's all David did. All the dumb stuff David did. All the idiot moves he made. At the end of the day, he said, I'm going to be honest. An honest heart is basically being a heart after God's own heart. An honest heart is basically a heart that is after God's own heart. Just be honest. I've used this so many times when Satan came to deceive me. And in my heart, I was just like, God, uh, I'm going to be honest with you. He already knows anyway. You read in the New Testament, the man who prayed, beat on his chest and said, you know, Lord, basically he said, I'm a sinner. I really don't deserve your blessing. I don't deserve for you to answer my prayer, but by faith, I'm going to call out to you. And uh, God, please hear my prayer. Man, God heard that prayer. All these religious prayers and this religious acting going on. I'm just like, man, I'm just really praying that God grant them repentance and they just, they just come clean, you know, because uh, the blood of Jesus is for everybody, but you got to have an honest heart and you got to be willing to, to turn to him and walk in the light. And you got to be willing even to deal with some things that are difficult to deal with, just being a human being. You know, I just believe honesty is a, a great key to the kingdom to, to advance and to progress into more of a Christ-like nature. And he said, conduct yourselves here with fear throughout the time of your exile or at your time here on earth. You got to, where's the fear of God? these days I, it's it's baffling how comfortable familiar lackadaisical people are when it comes to god i fear god i i really do fear god and and the fear of the lord will keep you from evil the fear of the lord will cause you to repent the fear of the Lord will cause you to say, you know what? I'm not doing that anymore. God, with everything in me, I don't want to do that anymore. Through your spirit, empower me. Let me get in this word because I don't want to sin against you, God. Because that's, God, please help us. Let me pray this real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, anyone listening to this or that will listen to this or view it, God, I pray you impart the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The spirit of the fear of the Lord. God, I pray for the impartation of the spirit of the fear of the Lord in your church. As we know, judgment starts in the house of the Lord. And Lord, I just see so many people in the church just, they just not fearing you. It's like they are just comfortable. God, shake us, rattle us. You said you will shake everything that can be shaken. Shake us to our core. 
Shake up the church. God, we want lost souls. We want to uh, save uh, those that are lost. But man, you got to start in the church, God. Some, the problem is in the church first. God, shake us up. Give us the fear of the Lord. Signs and wonders. I don't care if you got to open up the earth to show us visions of hell. God, this is serious. Please, Lord, give us the fear of the Lord again so we can walk in uprightness leading to sanctification and holiness. In Jesus' name. Knowing, this is verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from, from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a land without blemish or spot. So these traditions that people try to keep, traditions of man, traditions of religion, man, all that stuff, most of that stuff is just completely unnecessary. And he said, we've been redeemed from that. You know, like uh, yesterday, uh, March 17th, uh, American culture and probably across the world, St. Patrick's Day. That's a tra tradition. St. Patrick's Day? I mean, I was talking to my mom about this. Okay, people are celebrating a day called St. Patrick's Day by getting drunk. That's crazy. <laughs> First of all, it's crazy you're celebrating a day dedicated to a person other than Jesus Christ. I, I understand honor. Honor is good. But when you're dedicating a day to someone called St. Patrick, that's a tradition. That's a tradition of, of your forefathers. You're doing that because your dad did that, your mom did that, your brother, your sister, uh, your aunt, your uncle. Show me in the Bible where it said do that. I just have not seen that yet. I've read the Bible a lot. It's just that's just an example. Now, if you're Irish and you're like, oh, you're picking on Irish people, I'm not. I'm just using that as one example. You could go. The list goes on. Easter, Christmas. I mean, any traditions of man. And I'm not saying that you cannot celebrate them, but I'm saying when you and when you. Treat it as if God himself said, you have to do this or you're sinning and that you're off. That's just wrong. That's just wrong. You know, so you can celebrate it, but don't tell me I have to. Whatever you celebrate, if you celebrate it, don't tell me I have to. And my thing is people perish from a lack of knowledge. So why don't you do your due diligence and research and find out what you are really celebrating? What are the roots of it? What are the origins? Where did it come from? Why are we doing this? Sometimes you just got to ask why. Why? And when you ask why, be, be careful because people are going to accuse you of being a rebel. And you just, you know, you don't want to go along with the flow and you just, causing trouble and you don't want to do what we do and you always asking why and you always talking about scripture and where do, where's this in the bible and when did god say do this hey me personally i'm asking why i think that's how i get so far in the lord because i ask god questions i think you can get far in god just by asking questions man jesus christ told many stories that tells me that he wants to speak and if you're telling stories and parables in the Bible, Jesus, I'm going to ask questions respectfully. And I believe God's going to ask, answer those questions either through the word or through his spirit. It might be quickly. It may take five years. But I'm just not doing things out of tradition just because I saw somebody else do it. It just makes no sense to me. It just really doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, man, where's this coming from? You know. Now, if I'm asking a question and you show it to me in the word, and you, I say thank you. I didn't know that. I don't know everything. I'm still getting over ignorance. <laughs> you know, I'm still trying to learn. So I, I didn't. I just don't know everything. So if I ask a question, you say, okay, James, it's right in the Bible. This is why we do this. Like take communion. That's in the Bible. That's not a, just a tradition of man. That's something Jesus Christ said do. So you can show it to me in the words. So I'm going to th say thank you. Okay, now I see it. You know? But some things you cannot show me in the Bible, and it's just a tradition, and it's really keeping people from the Lord and from uh, deep fellowship with him. 
you know. Three minutes, James. Thanks, brother. Just like uh, Jesus celebrated, uh, as Rhonda just typed, uh, certain feast. Want to know why? Because it's in the word of God. <laughs> Jewish people celebrate certain feasts. It's in the word of God. That's not something a man came up with. That's something that the word of God, the Holy Spirit revealed to a people and said, I want you to celebrate this. That's not, not something some man thought of to either make some money or whatever. That's something in the word of God. Just like communion. That's just a great example of we're not taking communion out of a tradition. We're taking communion because it was uh, instructed to us out of the word of God. So let, let me wrap us up in prayer because there's something on this traditions of man. I may do a teaching on this one day, but it's something the Holy Spirit really wants to break. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray you break all the false traditions of men, false traditions that we have believed in our heart, false traditions that we have celebrated, false traditions in our ways of thinking and our ways of speaking and our ways of living. God, break that stronghold and those strongholds that are carnal secular, and have nothing to do with Jesus Christ. God, break it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Reveal to us the right way, which are your ways, and let us be free. He who the Son sets free and free is free indeed. Free us from the curse of the law. Not the law that says love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and love your neighbor as you love yourself, but any false laws, false religious practices that we thought were so important and we did to impress others or to please man, break it. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. The law is fulfilled in Jesus. And we thank you for being the liberator, Holy Spirit, where the Spirit is Lord, there is liberty. So I pray for a greater liberty to the body of Christ, those watching and those that will watch these, this Bible study, that the liberator, the Holy Spirit will free us from false traditions, past traditions that have nothing to do with the now and nothing to do with who we are in Jesus Christ and honoring you, Father. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. I want to just pray one more prayer um, because the Holy Spirit just quickened in, in me that, you know, some people that watch these videos uh, have not been saved. So I just want to break down a quick overview of what the gospel is and how to be saved. The gospel is basically you were born a sinner, you need a savior. That savior is Jesus Christ. So when you admit that you were born in sin and you can't help yourself, you can't help but sin because you were born in sin, you got to call out to the Lord Jesus Christ to save your soul. So the word of God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of God also says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, you shall be saved. It's just that simple. Turn from sin. Turn to Jesus. Call on his name and be saved. If you pray this prayer, please get in contact with any one of us, James Beattie, Craig Williams, or anyone else uh, that you may see in these Bible studies, just to help you with your process of discipleship because that's what it's all about, salvation. So thank you, Lord. That'll wrap it up from today. Obviously, we didn't even get past the first chapter in Peter, but hey, that's the way it goes sometime. Uh, we'll try again another time. God bless you, and thank you for tuning in. Amen. <clears throat>